continue. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody to 1559 Implementers Call number seven now. Uh, like I said, we have a bunch of things on the agenda. Um, I tried to list them in order uh, to go through them. Uh, so maybe we can we can just jump in. Uh, first item, uh, Tim Roughgarden, who's joining us today, uh, has put together a pretty extensive economic analysis of 1559. Um, he published it, I think, two days ago. So uh, hopefully people have had time to digest it since then. Um, but maybe, Tim, do you want to take a few minutes to just give a kind of short summary of, of the analysis? And then if people have questions or comments, we can we can go over those. Uh, sure, Tim. Happy to. Um, thanks for the invitation to join the call. Um, I don't want to go on too long because I want it to be driven more by people's questions, but maybe just sort of, I'll just quickly say kind of the structure of the report. Um, so after de describing, you know, just uh, recapping how 1559 works, um, so giving a, you know, fully precise, fully um, detailed definition of exactly how it works, um, the report talks about uh, how to think about um, a market of Ethereum transactions. So, you know, EVM computation is a scarce resource. And so ultimately, um, you know, users or creators of transactions are vying for that scarce resource. Um, so ultimately, that's the point of the transaction fee mechanism um, to figure out who gets access to that resource and, and what the price is. Um, and sort of the purpose of that discussion uh, around Ethereum, the market for Ethereum transactions is, is primarily to clarify um, you know, what 1559 can be expected and cannot be expected to accomplish with respect to the, the level of transaction fees. Because I know there's a lot of concern in the community about high transaction fees. Um, and the main point I wanted to make there is just that, you know, you know, when, when sort of uh, demand for EVM computation far outstrips its supply, you're going to have high transaction fees. It really doesn't matter what mechanism you use. 1559 does help with things like absorbing uh, short-term demand spikes. And so as a result, uh, you should see uh, lower maximum transaction fees, you know, in periods of, of high demand. But again, when you have much more demand than supply, no matter what the mechanism is, you're going to see persistently high um, transaction fees. So then with that out of the way, then I start to analyze um, 1559 uh, in two ways. Um, so the most technical part of the report, sections five and six, um, that's really analyzing the incentives of, of 1559 at the time scale uh, of a single block. Okay, so thinking about say miners who only care about the revenue that they get from that one block and are not thinking about making short-term sacrifices to reap rewards Later on, similar users who are just focused on getting a transaction in the current block and are just trying to figure out how to bid. Um, and so sections five and six outline several game theoretic guarantees that you might want a mechanism to have. So miners should be incentivized to do what you would like them to do. Users should be incentivized to you know, bid in some sort of obvious optimal way. Um, and then also you'd like robustness to off-chain agreements so that users and miners can't easily collude, for example, to sort of basically steal money from the from the protocol. Uh, so those are sections five and six, sort of uh, listing those three properties. Um, first price auctions, the status quo has two of those three properties, but 1559 has, has all of them, uh, or at least almost. So in particular, um, the, those sections include a mathematical definition of what sort of easy fee estimation might mean or what a sort of good UX might mean. Um, and first price auctions do not satisfy that property. And the 1559 mechanism does satisfy that property, except during um, periods where the base fee is much too low, okay, which would signify that there's been a very rapid uh, increase in demand where the base fee hasn't had a chance to, to catch up yet. So those are five and six. They're the most sort of technical sections in the report. Section seven, um, I discuss, uh, you know, attacks or manipulations you'd be worried about that take place over longer time scales. Um, and so for this, you're usually thinking about a cartel of miners um, because any one or at least mining pools because uh, any one miner is probably mining blocks sufficiently infrequently that you know long-term strategies aren't, aren't, aren't that useful. But if you have a well-coordinated mining pool or if you have a cartel of miners with a large amount of hash rate, all of a sudden you start sort of worrying about what they might do if they strategize over time. For example, you know, could they manipulate the base fee downward to reduce the fee burn? Um, and so section seven, I, from what I could tell, it seemed like this was the one that's generated the most kind of discussion on, you know, say Twitter thus far. Um, so maybe let me just sort of say what I, what I think the sec what I was trying to say with the section. 
Um, so the first goal was just to sort of revisit first price auctions, the status quo, um, and ask the same question, right? So like, what could miners in principle do by colluding over long time scales? And what do they actually seem to do? And so there, you know, we identified collusive strategies that would in fact be in miners' interest if they implemented them. And then we observed that miners do not seem to actually do uh, do sustained um, long-term collusion. And, you know, I, I'm not in a position to conclusively say why that is. I just sort of listed a whole bunch of reasons that I thought of and that people have told me about here are the reasons why we might not see this kind of sustained collusion with first price auctions. Um, and then I go to, on to observe that, you know, that whole list of reasons that apply to first price auctions apply equally well to the 1559 mechanism. So there, there do seem to be impediments to collusion by miners now under first price auctions. Um, and, you know, and nothing about 1559 makes it easier for miners to collude. Now, 1559 may make it miners more motivated to collude because now they sort of have, you know, this, this additional incentive of evading the fee burn. So the point of this section is just to say that in some sense, the cost of colluding I don't see any reason why that would go down with 1559. It's as difficult as before. However, it is true the benefit may go up to miners of pulling off the collusion. And I try to be very careful in the report of not predicting whether we'll see significant minor collusion or not. Um, and the final section of section seven, um, the caveats explicitly discusses this point, you know, that they, miners may be more motivated than they, to collude than they ever have been before. And so in particular, there may be types of collusion we have not seen under first price auctions, which we will see not because they're easier to pull off, but just because um, you know, they're motivated, they're more motivated, motivated to do it. Um, section eight is something I thought would have generated a little more uh, discussion than it has thus far. Um, so I think, uh, so the first part of section eight is just to clarify that you can't really do sort of the fee burn without the base fee or vice versa um, with an exception. And so this is section eight three, this is one of the two alternative designs I discussed in the report. Um, so the first alternative design is, so it's really crucial for the game theory, the, the role that the fee burn plays. What's really important is to withhold base fee revenues from the miner of the block, which generates those base fee revenues. Uh, so it has to be withheld from the miner who mines the block. The simplest way to do that is with a fee burn. And of course, there's lots of other reasons why people like a fee burn as well, but section 8.3 points out that the game theoretic uh, properties are really just as good as long as you pay those base fee revenues to somebody else. For example, and this is a proposal I've seen by uh, Vitalik and possibly others, for example, you could instead pay the base fee revenues to miners of future blocks, okay? Um, so for example, the next thousand blocks, you could spread it out equally. And then there is no fee burn. Basically, just each block now is kind of a bonus added to its block reward, depending on the sort of base fee revenues from the previous, say, thousand blocks. So that's one of the main alternatives uh, suggested, which I actually have not seen discussed um, so far. Uh, and then the other one is a version of the 1559 mechanism where instead of the tips being user specified, um, you hard code them into the mechanism. And this has some problems, like you would expect um, sort of off-chain tip markets to emerge. Um, you know, I, I give no opinion on whether that's a deal breaker problem or not, but you would expect that to happen. On the other hand, it's uh, definitely simpler uh, to have hard-coded tips, uh, and it has some nicer game theoretic properties. Uh, you know, which just explaining that we get into the weeds. But so there are some nice, um, nice uh, aspects of that second alternative design that I call the tipless mechanism in the support. And then the last section of section eight is I talk about the base fee update rule, and this again I've sort of seen. Um, people coming up with very reasonable um, requests that this should be analyzed from a control theoretic perspective. I, I totally agree. I think actually it's probably a quite easy control theory problem if you found, if you found an expert. Um, but in any case, you know, arguably the most sort of arbitrary feeling uh, aspect of the 1559 proposal is the specific way that the base fee evolves over time. Um, so the functional form, you know, all the choices are sort of natural. You can see why one would make them or why they're a natural guess. But the functional form is sort of arbitrary, you know, one plus an adjustment factor. Um, you know, there's two magic numbers in the rule, sort of the one eighth, which controls how rapidly the base fee can increase or decrease. Um, and then also there's this question, you know, there's a magic number of exactly how much bigger should the maximum block size be compared to the, to the target block size. Um, so in that section, section 86, I try to clarify all of the assumptions that are baked into the current update rule. 
Um, and you know, what are the different, what are some different dimensions that you know they should be experimented with over time? And it may, you know, it may be hard to iterate on the update rule until there's actual data from a real deployment. Um, just from the armchair, it's hard to have a compelling case of why something else would be better than the current one. But I, I just wanted to, you know, a heads up that probably this will want to be revisited over time, like the various other parameters that are revisited um, with every network upgrade. Uh, and then in the last section, section nine, I talk a little bit about the other benefits of 1559. So the report focuses just on sort of good UX, um, easy fee estimation. But of course, there's lots of other reasons people are excited about 1559. So I just talk about what those are in section 91, most notably the fee burn, but also kind of preventing economic abstraction, um, having a reliable measure of kind of the current gas price that's hard to manipulate uh, for use in smart contracts. Uh, and then the final section um, discusses uh, the escalator, both kind of as a standalone proposal and also how that might be integrated uh, into 1559. Um, so that's sort of the executive summary of everything discussed in the report. And, and obviously, if people have specific questions about parts of it, I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to address those. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Um, does anyone on the call have any questions, thoughts? I have a question, which isn't necessarily something explored in the reports, but I'm quite curious about your intuition with regards to it. Uh, the question is, uh, do you have any thoughts on what you think would happen with, if you have two parallel markets running during a transitionary period? Because one of the suggestions has been to have both the first price auction accepting those kind of transactions with the, with the 1559 in parallel. And I'm curious if you might have an intuition about maybe some emergence effects that might happen, or I don't know, just curious about your thoughts on it. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So just to clarify, um, so the sort of transition plan, you know, I've seen this, a few different things discussed. My understanding is that plan A is you would have a period you know, where legacy transactions we can we would be converted auto, or, or sort of interpreted automatically in the 1559 format by taking the gas price and interpreting it as sort of both the fee cap and the tip. Is that is that the is that the specific proposal that you are that you're talking about? That one as well, but there is another level to this, which is uh, the pun wasn't intended, but when you talk about layer two systems because many layer two systems that we see think about also having a fee market running on top of the base layers fee market. So there's the transitional periods where you do this translation, but also dual markets when you have second layer markets running on top of it. I see, so, so you're saying interactions between this change at layer one ver you know, versus what happens upstream. But also inside the layer one itself, I guess these are two separate problems, but yeah, those are the two that I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. They're really they're separate things. Um, I mean, you know, I, the discussion I've just seen around, I feel like some 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 good thought have has gone into and discussion has gone into how to manage the transition, you know, by the by the by the fifteen fifty nine team, um, and I have not seen, you know, in some ways. I mean, I'll, I'm not I'm not in the trenches with the implementation, so I can't comment on that, but. You know, from what I've seen, the, the plan seems very reasonable, um, you know, to have a to have a peer. So and one thing that's nice about it, potentially, uh, one would hope. So first of all, people don't have to, you know, wallets don't have to change initially if you have these sort of support for legacy transactions. And then you would hope that there would be economic pressure over time um, for everyone to switch over to the 1559 format, right? Because there's really basically two parameters to play with, uh, the tip um, and the fee cap in 1559. And if you don't bother to pay attention to that, you're kind of stuck with this much sort of more restrictive way of bidding where you just set the one gas price. Um, so that's that's one thing that I, I think is nice about that transaction. I mean, so first of all, I mean, it seems clear you don't just want sort of a, an immediate sort of hard stop where the legacy transactions aren't accepted. And so this seems like a really nice way to have them around for a while, but at the same time, you know, there is an economic incentive for them to, to hopefully go away over time. Um, the layer one, layer two interaction, I mean, I, I'd probably have to know more details about, you know, I assume that happens in like, you know, various ways for various layer twos. And so I needed more no details uh, to talk about it at length. Um, you know, I will say, you know, I, I mentioned this briefly that one of the side benefits of having this base fee 
is it should make it easier to sort of know what is like the typical gas price at any given moment, uh, namely the base fee, unless you're in a period of rapidly increasing demand. Whereas if you just kind of looked at EtherScan right now and you sort of look at a block and you kind of like, well, if I wanted to associate a single gas price with this block, what would it be? I mean, you could use the minimum, the average, the median, et cetera. There's these statistics you could use. Um, but you know, there's worries about, you know, those could be manipulated if people knew what statistic you were using. Uh, whereas the base fee is hard to manipulate. And again, outside of um, sort of sharply increasing demand, you know, should give you a reliable uh, measure um, of the sort of current gas price. So my hope would be that that would be a quite useful additional functionality or a, a really an improvement for um, interactions with layer two down the line. So I, I think, hi, Tim. Um, I, I think the easy way to think of the layer two thing is you have uh, the layer two chain um, generates blocks at a higher frequency than the layer one chain. And it's using um, within its own domain, the exact same algorithm. So it takes a bunch of transactions, it generates blocks, it then publishes those blocks on L1 in an L1 transaction. And that's basically all there is to it. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah. I suspect what Fred might be referring to is before the, the first version of 1559, we had had um, two transaction pools at the same time. So within a single block, you'd have basically two, half the gas was dedicated to 1559 transactions, half the gas dedicated to legacy transactions. And so I suspect the question might have been, um, what kind of interactions do you expect to see there? I see. If, I see. if we did that instead. Interesting. So like, would there be perverse incentives to, you know? Yeah, to like, you have to, because that, it gets definitely more complicated for users. Can I have to decide, you know, which is better for you? Do you want to do 1559 transaction? Right, right. I sure do you want to try for a, the gamble of legacy transaction or gas price, you know? Right, exactly. And my recollection is this is part of why, correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my sense was that this idea was set aside in favor of this kind of default interpretation of legacy transactions in part because that problem goes away. Is that right? Or yeah, that problem goes away and a couple others as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, it's not something I've thought about deeply, but, you know, the latest transition plans that I've seen to me seem like a pretty smart approach. Are there any drawbacks with this automatic conversion? So I'll have some comments on this uh, transition, but perhaps Michel can, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. So Michel wrote a notebook uh, on the transition period between 1559 and legacy transactions. Uh, maybe you can share it now. Uh, hi, yeah, mm, sure. Um, I guess, sorry, uh, yeah, just before we go, are there just uh, like other areas of questions that people had about the report? Uh, because I think, yeah, uh, the legacy conversion and whatnot is a whole other uh, can of worms. Uh, and like, yeah, I think we can cover it right after, but I just want to give the space if people have other <laughs> other questions uh, that they wanted to bring up about the uh, economic analysis first. Yeah, uh, I have before... just one. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so I have one question. No, I think it's particularly I mean, slightly outside of the report, but still very relevant. So if we look only in the transaction market as something that exists by itself and the transaction value is always um, external, there is no other market to, uh, to relate to, it's all fine. But what if we have a decentralized finance market where mar miners can, uh, can hatch the cost of, uh, of collusion, like of the attack? if they can actually benefit from the higher fee burning or the fees going down. In particular, we actually work on the project where miners would be able to make financial transactions where they would benefit if the uh, fees go higher or lower. And if they can actually make big bets on this, then they can cover the cost of attack. Did you consider this kind of um, Correlate like a co coexistence of two markets, the decentralized finance market and the transaction fee market. Yeah, I, so not explicitly. I mean, what but, you know, I find it quite interesting. Um, and in particular, I mean, I think where it ties into the report is the discussion around um, how to get minor buy-in into the proposal. 
Um, and, you know, so you, you could argue, you know, to what extent is it ne necessary? And then if you agree that it's necessary, you can argue about how you might want to do it. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, having some kind of, you know, financial instruments so that you can argue that miners are going to win either way, especially if it's something where like they're in a particular, they're particularly well positioned maybe to make smart bets um, on them. You know, you could imagine that um, uh, sort of speeding up uh, sort of adoption, um, you know, sort of lowering the, the you know, the, the current sort of um, pushback that, that I, I believe the community is seeing from miners. Uh, great, thank you. When, when you were analyzing the, uh, uh, sorry, which uh, section? I had a question and I just lost it. Damn it, someone else go. Yeah, I would just like to make a brief comment. I mean, the the as the person who proposed the um, two stage, um, you know, having two transaction types and two transaction pools, uh, the purpose of that was not game theoretic. It was to force the removal of the dead code path of having one transaction type be interpreted two different ways. Um, just to clarify. Yeah. There's also something else that may be worth noting. Uh, I'll just brush it over quickly, which is you can see the layer two transaction fee market interact in a similar way to this first proposal of two transaction pools, because you can see it as part of the layer one gas being used and reserved for a separate transaction fee market. So I think the interactions in those might be comparable, but not with this new transition period scheme. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I, I mean, that's a really interesting idea. I think the difference is, is that the, um, well, I think there's two points and I'll, I'll be say the nicer one first. The, let's say you're using, you know, the operator of the layer two, whether that's a federation or an individual, whatever, they ultimately have some discretion, right? So they can, they have within their protocol, the ability to not participate in the next uh, layer one block. So I, I so it is a, it is a segmentation, but the two different pools are under different authorities. So that's a pretty big difference. And then the sort of corollary to that is um, 1559 doesn't stop the layer two operators from bribing miners, which is probably what they'd end up doing, practically speaking. Good point. Um, there's one more question. I think you already kind of answered this, Tim, uh, but Nick Johnson, who's been one of the, I guess, friendliest critics of 1559 and, and really wanted to see your report, uh, he posted on Twitter yesterday. Uh, I'll share the actual tweet in the in the comments here, and I'll try to just uh, summarize his, his question. Um, basically, uh, in section seven, 745, uh, you explained that miners could make uh, uh, these cartels, but it hasn't happened before. Um, and he says, uh, this is probably not a sound way to think about it. Um, and uh, basically that the incentive structure is still the same under 1559 as it is now, but it fails to consider the magnitude is very different. Today, a cartel benefits from the difference between monopoly, monopoly pricing and market carrying price. Uh, but under 1559, it would benefit to the tune of the difference between the monopoly price and the cost price, which is much larger. Um, yeah, so does, I guess you mentioned earlier that the cost of collusion kind of stays the same, but the benefit goes up. Uh, I assume that would be kind of the same answer here to Nick's concern. Right, so I, so I tried to be careful on this point in the report. Maybe, I mean, maybe there's a way I could have written it that it would have been clearer. Um, but I guess I would point to, you know, if you look at the very first sentence of section 7.4, just when I start classifying different types of minor collusion, the very first sentence of the, of, the, of the section is, you know, I offer no prediction on whether there will be collusion under 1559. Um, so, okay, if I don't, what, so then what do I do? I just say, let's, let's sort of make a, do an observational study of the status quo under first price auctions, brainstorm possible re reasons why we're not saying, seeing collusion, and then assess to what, you know, and then, you know, for each of these, you know, 
apparent impediments to collusion, do any of those impediments break down because of something specific to 1559? And I argue that no. And you know, if, if sort of in the top 10 takeaways, uh, you know, it's number five, right? So, so, so the, the assertion is not that collusion is as unlikely under 1559 than first price auctions. I didn't say that, and I very intentionally didn't say that. I just said the impediments are as strong. Okay, meaning like the problem is as difficult as far as I can tell uh, for miners to collude under 1559 as it is now. Now that doesn't, again, I, I'm not saying that collusion is less likely for exactly the, the reason that Nick mentions, um, which is that they might see either, either just because the economic reasons are more at stake or they may feel betrayed, you know, by the community and therefore sort of, um, you know, less altruistic. And so that's, that's covered in the section 746. So right after the the, or sorry, in, in seven six, I guess, the caveat section. Um, and, you know, there again, uh, there's a sentence that says, you know, this strong negative reaction, I was referring to your, your survey, your questionnaire by uh, Tim, uh, this strong negative reaction may galvanize miners to sustain collusion to a, to a degree not yet seen under the status quo. So, so I, I completely agree with Nick's point. Um, I tried to make that explicit in the report. Perhaps it should have been positioned a little differently, so it was more, so, so it sort of stood out more. Um, but I actually don't think there's any disagreement there. Cool. So Thanks this, this gets into this gets into the question I was going to ask, which is, and I can just talk about instead. Um, I think the magnitude is off by a pretty large margin here, I believe, because right now, if miners were to fifty-one percent collude they would make double the block reward plus plus transaction fees. With 1559, a 51% collude can still make double the block reward and they get a little bit more transaction fees on top of that. And while we have seen some big spikes in transaction fees periodically, the baseline is still way below the block reward. And so it's like, you know, if, if you can collude with 51% and you can make, you know, $100 million, or now with 1559, you include and make $101 million. And it's like, I feel like that order of magnitude is nowhere near enough to tip the scales. Um, just because like the, the gains from colluding with, for, for, for colluding and manipulating 1559 transactions are just so small compared to colluding just with any type of transaction mining. Just by censoring 49% of miners, you double your money. It's easy money right there. So if you have, if you can collude, you can make way more money doing other things. And so if, that's that's where I feel like the the real argument here should be is that the order of magnitude is just too small. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think you okay. might well be right. I guess I. In the report, I didn't want to presuppose how the base fee revenues would compare to the block reward. Um, I just felt like that, any that's fair I, and reasonable. I thought any prediction I made on that point, I might just look quite foolish you know, a couple of years from now. Um, <laughs> sure. And right. So I guess um, was the uh, maybe that was the main thing I wanted to say. Yeah. Any other? Final questions for Tim. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Tim, for, for sharing all this. This was pretty helpful. Um, and I'll make sure to link the report in, in the notes uh, that we have for this call. Yeah, and, and um, so I'm gonna have to sign off, but I mean, just sort of a general comment. I mean, you know, it, 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 this was not like some report I envisioned just like, you know, issuing into the world and then you know, never, never discussing with anybody. So I mean, I, I mean it's really a report I made, you know, the, the point of it is to be helpful to the Ethereum community. Um, and so if there's, you know, follow up questions or, or, or anything that would, that would make it more helpful, um, I'm obviously very receptive to that, to that feedback and in, in future discussions. So. And what's the best way maybe for people who are watching the recording to reach out to you? Uh, so email tim.roughgarden at gmail.com. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, so Michelle, I hope I'm getting your name right. Uh, 
yeah, do you want to go into your report around the legacy transaction simulations? Uh, yeah, sure. So maybe I will try to make it uh, quick. Just, just I will give you the sum summary of what uh, I did. So maybe to start with, uh, what was the goal of this uh, report of this simulation uh, I created? I wanted to answer the question uh, how um, legacy transactions uh, will be treated versus uh, 1559 transactions uh, by the network. Uh, when uh, 1559 is uh, in, in use. Uh, I wanted to answer the question whether maybe the network will give preferential treatment to one type of transactions or uh, other types. So uh, I created the simulation that is based on the library ABM 1559 that was prepared by uh, Barnabe. Barnabe. Uh, sorry if I also pronounce your name uh, wrong. Uh, I introduced some changes, but uh, I, I use it this, this library uh, heavily. So, um, in my simulation, uh, I distinguish, uh, let's say, three types of uh, transactions. So, or maybe three types of users. So, we have uh, legacy users that, for some reasons, uh, don't use uh, APE 1559. And uh, when this kind of uh, users uh, submit transactions, uh, these transactions have a uh, gas, gas premium or tip set to the same value as um, max T. Uh, then we have uh, 1559 users that utilize uh, a 1559. But here I decided to distinguish, let's say, knife uh, user, uh, which always sets um, a gas premium to the same uh, value one uh, GUI. So he, he, this kind of users um, do not analyze transaction pool to figure out what is the optimal, the best uh, value of gas premium. And and we also have something I uh, call clever uh, 1559 uh, users uh, that look at the transaction pool and try to figure out uh, the gas premium they should use in order uh, to be included in the block uh, as soon as it is uh, possible. Uh, ah, I forgot to say that uh, legacy, legacy, legacy users also try to analyze uh, transaction pool in order to fig figure out the best uh, gas, gas price. And in each iteration uh, of the um, sim simulation, I generate um, the same number of, of legacy transactions, uh, knife, uh, transactions from knife users and transactions from uh, these clever uh, users. And um, what, what is uh, important, uh, I have, um, uh, when we look um, not at the pairs, but at the um, trio of uh, tra uh, tra transactions uh, from each, each of these three kinds uh, of users, they have the same um, value, I mean, a business, value, a business value the user associates, uh, associates with given transaction. Why? Because uh, we, I want to compare, let's say, apples uh, with apples. If I have in the, uh, and I think that uh, if I have in the transaction uh, pool uh, one legacy transaction, one clever transaction, when knife transaction with the same uh, business uh, uh, value, then uh, I can I can um, compare compare them in the reasonable way. Uh, and as to the. Um, uh, uh, conclusions um, let's say the, the most important uh, okay so firstly if we look uh, I calculate a lot of statistics and, and, and metrics so I will only tell about the the, the, the basic uh, ones but uh, if we look at these um, uh, statistics uh, we can distinguish um, phase one and phase two by the phase one I mean a situation when a base fee uh, very very quickly very dynamically uh, grows and uh, phase two when this base fee reaches stabiliz st st stabilization. So uh, in this first uh, phase, uh, all these statistics I, ca I calculate like average uh, gas price per block, uh, average waiting time, and, and, and many different, they change uh, very, very, very dy dynamically and it is quite even quite difficult to, to, to reason uh, about this uh, phase. Nonetheless, this this phase uh, is quite um, quite sh quite sh quite short, and then we have this uh, se second phase when it is much easier to reason about the behavior of the network. Um, 
so uh, according to my uh, simul simulation, and I think uh, it is um, good good information, when the base fee reaches reaches stabilization, uh, transactions from all all these three uh, types of users will be included in the uh, in, in, in the blocks. Uh, so uh, we don't have the situation that, for example, only legacy transactions are in blocks, or only uh, eight, 15, 59 transactions are uh, in the block. Uh, of, however, in this uh, first stage, when um, a base fee grows uh, uh, quickly, here the situation is, uh, is different because in this stage I observe that uh, mainly or almost only uh, these clever uh, 1559 transactions are included uh, in blocks. As to the mm, mm, Ah, and uh, what it means is that um, uh, it also means that almost only these uh, clever uh, 1559 users uh, will take advantage from the lower va values uh, of, of, of the base, base, base fee. Base fee. Uh, when it comes to the um, gas, uh, gas, gas price, uh, here let's say um, contagions are, are not su su surprising. Uh, this uh, knife 1559 users will pay um, the, the list. Why? Because they do not try to be clever. They they simply always pay the same uh, the same the same gas premium. Uh, whereas uh, clever 1559 users or legacy users who looks into transaction uh, uh, pool who, who wants to pay uh, more to be included in the blocks, they pay uh, slightly 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 more. But if we compare legacy users and 1559 uh, users, uh, they more or less pay, pay the same. Mm, what else? Uh, I implemented very simple uh, trans transaction, uh, transaction pool. So I simply assume that uh, I can have some maximum number of transactions in, in the transaction uh, pool. And when there is more, tr more transactions, I simply uh, uh, remove from the transaction pool those uh, the worst. Uh, what I mean by by the worst, uh, I order, uh, I sort transactions based on the gas premium they offer to the uh, to the to the miner. Uh, so, uh, and what is uh, important, I observe evictions from the transaction pool almost only in this initial uh, initial phase. Then, when uh, base fee reaches stabilization, uh, there are almost no uh, there are no, no there are no uh, evictions and transaction transaction pool is uh, not full at all mm. uh, what else uh, uh, one one more thing um, but this is another conclusion let's say that is quite let's say natural not, not, nothing uh, surprising I also calculated uh, average uh, waiting time of the transaction in the transaction pool. So uh, of course, these knife uh, 1559 transactions, uh, which always pay the same gas premium, needs to wait uh, needs to wait more than uh, leg legacy or clever clever 1559 uh, transactions to be included uh, in, in the block. In the block. Mm. Uh, ho ho however, um, I spotted one interesting thing. Uh, Though I cannot uh, explain that uh, uh, now wh wh why it happened. Uh, sometimes I observe that uh, legacy transactions wait longer, and sometimes I observe that uh, this clever uh, 1559 transactions uh, waits longer in the um, transaction, transaction, transaction pool. Uh, I need to analyze it more, careful, more carefully to explain wh uh, why it uh, happened. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, those were the most uh, those were the bullet points, the most uh, uh, important uh, uh, conclusions uh, I noticed. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Hey, um, hi. Yeah, I really enjoyed the notebook, Michel. I think it was a really great use of the library, actually. And I've, I've been gotten like to play around a bit with it uh, since the start of the week. So with Fred, we've been looking at how to, let's say, look at oracles that give um, like first price auction legacy users information about the current uh, price that they should pay. 
uh, one piece of code that Fred added was this idea that users who are using, so let's say we are after the transition, we have 15, 59 users, legacy users, uh, and the legacy users are deciding their fees based on the oracles, which is also kind of what you are doing in your, in your notebook. Um, so when, when you have these oracles, like the presence of a base fee, even though it's implicit for the, for the legacy users, um, it, it has a sort of stabilizing effect on the oracle. So let's say I have 50% of my users who are legacy and 50% of my users who are 15, 59. Uh, you can think of it as some of the users know the correct price, that's the 50, 15, 59 users. And so since they know the correct price and that's the price they're putting in their transactions, they're actually tilting the oracles toward uh, giving that price for the legacy users. So I think of it as almost like a, the first price auction is this boiling pot of water and the 15, 59 users are just throwing cold water, like lowering the temperature. Uh, so allowing the legacy users to, to, to almost like have a better, let's say, uh, estimation of the current price in the market. Although it's a complete, it's very implicit, like it's not direct, but it goes through the Oracle. And that may explain also why uh, by the end, when base fee is stabilizing, uh, you find that, let's say, legacy users and 15, 59 users are included in the block in almost equal proportion as they are uh, when they join uh, the market. So yeah, if you have, I think the, the idea that we had in mind was that since legacy transaction users would be overpaying, uh, they would tend to maybe have some sort of priority, but that's no longer true, let's say, when base fee starts to stabilize, because when that happens, the oracles will start to sort of align themselves with the base fee and provide to the legacy users the actual base fee. And so, so you should kind of expect this convergence. I don't know if it makes sense and if it's maybe something that you, you noted as well. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, in my, my simulation, the results uh, totally confirm what you just said. And maybe just uh, one comment. Uh, what, you, what you said is uh, totally true. Uh, but if we only if we assume that these legacy legacy users will be mm, mm, will not uh, will not overpay too much because uh, at least in my sim sim simulation yeah uh, legacy users uh, ask oracle for the for, for the for, for the best uh, uh, price but this uh, oracle returns uh, the minimal uh, the, uh, the, the op optimal, the, the minimal price. However, if we have some legacy users who really want to pay uh, much more to be included in, uh, uh, in to be included in, in blocks, then then pro then probably, even if the base fee uh, sta sta stabilizes, we will see that. I think that we will see more legacy users in, in, in blocks. Yeah, I, actually, it's true, but it, I don't think it's true to the magnitude that we expect. So, for instance. Some, most of your records are based on some kind of percentile of the past transaction. So you look at the, let's say 95% top paying transaction and, and you set the, the, so like MetaMask when it gives you the fast price, it's, it's kind of like this very high percentile. But if you have like base fee, which is kind of stable and most of the transactions, even some of the legacy users who are using the slow or medium, uh, who might be actually targeting the exact base fee, uh, it might start even uh, let's say tilt the fast oracle, so the one that would make you overpay uh, towards the base fee itself again, because it's, it's sort of a distribution thing where, because the fee variance is reduced in the block, thanks to the base fee, uh, you also have this effect that propagates to the, to the oracle itself. Unless the oracle is some sort of uh, fixed, let's say I make you overpay by five GUI. But I think most oracles are based on this idea of looking at the distribution of transactions and setting the, the price like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe uh, one more uh, one more thing, uh, because it seems to me that um, we will see this uh, stabilizing stabilization uh, effect only if we have a big enough number of fifteen fifty nine users uh, users using the, the, the network. Uh, so um, here, of course, it's only a, a guessing. Uh, the question is how it will look uh, in, in practice. 
if we have, uh, let's say, 80-90% of the GASA users and only 10% of 1559 uh, uh, users, uh, I think that it, it wouldn't look uh, so nice when we have 50% of, 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 of the GASA users and 50% of uh, 1559 users. How yeah, so, sorry, I would just like to comment on that. Um, yeah, I think that's an extremely good point. And I think to me, I, I mean, I really appreciate all this research and I think it's really interesting, fascinating work. As a practical matter, um, if collectively the community can do something to ensure that 1559 gets adopted by someone like, say, MetaMask, then we, a lot of this simulation, we don't really have to worry about these corner cases, right? We just know that the majority of people will use 1559. Well, yeah, I think in, oh, no, oh, I, was, I was just going to add, I think uh, we had a bunch of discussions about this in the past as well, but like we can start with this, you know, neutral approach of like reaching out to folks. There is uh, already, I think, a lot of support for 1559 in the community. So, you know, step one is like you reach out to folks like MetaMask, um, like, you know, Coinbase, whatnot, ask them to support this. Um, and then step two is like, if that doesn't work in the next hard fork, do you want to add like a carrot or a stick, right? With regards to gas prices or whatnot. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to predict in advance what the adoption rate will be um, and, and therefore to come up with like a good, uh, a good plan for like, how do you get the people who you would have wanted to adopt it that are not adopting it to actually do so? Also, I do think that there are self-stabilizing incentives in the sense that the less stable the base fee behaves, just because fewer people have adopted 1.59 so far, the more incentive there is to actually uh, adopt um, one for, like move to 1.59 transactions as an individual user, just because, like again, with one with legacy transactions, you tend to overpay or just in general. It's, it's it's less controllable and so basically like the the, the fewer people are using 1.59 the more like attractive it is for individuals to move over but to like profit from the like increased stability locally and so i, I would assume that like it, it very quickly kind of uh would converge to a situation where enough people moved over that the overall situation becomes relatively stable at least under most conditions. yeah but but of course that's that's hard to tell that's a really good point and i think what's interesting is a lot of the projects we spoke to as part of the outreach um, that were managing transactions on the behalf of their users really care about giving their users the best price and the best UX. So if there is kind of an incentive to do so, um, I suspect we'll see, you know, a lot of projects wanting to differentiate by adding that. Um, yeah. So another consequence with this insight that the oracles converge is that the more 1559 users you have, the easier it is for legacy users to keep uh, using the legacy transaction, like the less they would overpay because the better their oracles would kind of tend to become. So bouncing on what Rick said, if you get the 80% users by having MetaMask switch to 1559, then this long tail of users who are not switching, is actually not that bad for them. Uh, they get a somewhat correct rate. Still, you have like, of course, it's kind of a gradient between if everybody is using first price auction versus if everybody is using 1559. But uh, yeah, if most users are 1559 users, then I guess uh, from a legacy user perspective, you might not be overpaying that much either. And I think that's not the end of the world, right? Like the, the direction we're going to, we're going in at the protocol right now is like if we have support for these 2930 transactions, these 1559 transactions, the legacy transactions, I suspect we'll have to carry a bunch of different transaction types for a while. Um, so I don't think, so I think there's maybe a more meta discussion about like, how do we deal with this long tail of like older transaction versions um, that's kind of out of scope for 1559. And if we have some reasonable, you know, intuitions that there are good incentives for a, a large portion of the network to adopt it, um, I think that's probably sufficient given, uh, yeah, that we still have to maintain some types of legacy transactions anyways due to other reasons. That actually leads me to a question I was having uh, earlier. So um, in case that the transition, like the initial uh, transition to, to 1559 uh, goes smoothly and like, there's a lot of adoption early on, 
Um, a lot of people earlier basically talked about transition periods. That would imply that there's like some end of the period where then presumably you would completely phase out legacy transactions. I'm just one, I, I mean, you, you're basically just saying that that, that that might not be like a necessary, at least like immediately or something. I was wondering, is there even, is there any like, important reason why you would ever want to pay, fully phase out legacy transactions instead of just continuously converting them forever? Because I mean, there are always these edge cases, maybe yeah. someone is yeah. using some hardware wallet where they really don't have, have a way of generating I think transaction the, types or something. The short answer is client code complexity. Um, and, and the way, I, I guess the scenario under which it would be very helpful is if you have clients that don't want to sync for ge from Genesis for a reason, um, so, you know, some people have talked about like regenesis, things like that, but maybe a more possible or concrete thing is like, assume there's the ETH1, ETH2 merge, right? Maybe people want to write clients to be like an ETH1 engine for ETH2, but not sync everything since ETH1's genesis, just like start processing stuff at the merge block. Um, them, if, if you got to a point there where say, I don't know, legacy transactions are not supported anymore, they just don't have to implement that. And it makes the client much easier to do that. Um, so I think that's the main argument in favor. But when you talk with teams like Geth or you know other client teams that need to support clients from Genesis, it doesn't really make a big difference that, you know, say to us on base if we deprecate 15 to 59 transactions or not, because we still need to validate all the blocks where there were legacy transactions. So that means we need to keep that code in the client as well. Um, but I think that's, yeah, the biggest benefit is you could build a client from the spot where you don't process those transactions anymore. Yeah, I mean, okay. at, at, also... the, at the time, my thinking was that um, there would just be a, potentially a lot of complex dynamics by keeping this old, by having two transaction types that are possible. And it, I just thought it was really difficult to reason about. I was having a very difficult time figuring out which one you know, what would happen. And so it's better to just like close that, that door, both from like an engineering perspective, but as, as Tim points out, uh, that kind of doesn't work because you have to replay from Genesis, but then also to sort of close that door in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, exploitation. One can also mention sense. a a client that has, so for each time there's a fork block, the consensus rules change. One can imagine a client architecture where you have a separate engine for each uh, fork. And so it'd be nice if your new engines don't have to speak, but you don't touch them. It's like, you know, your version one, you don't touch it. You maybe get security updates, but that's it. Um, whereas you don't want your V1 code sitting in your V7 code code base, which may be completely yeah. isolated. Again, depend on your architecture. I suspect in practice though, given the current clients that exist and teams working on them, nothing like that will happen before an ETH1, ETH2 merge. Um, yeah, i happy to be proven wrong, but yeah, my hunch is uh, this is the only kind of point at which it makes sense to change the architecture so much to, to get there. Um, this is a bit of a tangent though. Um, yeah, did people have any other questions about uh, the legacy transaction simulations? If not, um, yeah. Uh, Ansgar, I think you had some uh, updates you wanted to share about the transaction pool management, which we spent a bunch of time talking, on, uh, talking about on the last call. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so, so, so just for context, I haven't been following. So I've been following the one, the 1559 efforts like loosely, but, but not, I, I, I haven't like joined most of the um, uh, previous implementers calling everything. So, so I'm, I, I might not be fully up to speed, but um, uh, basically like Tim, Tim, Tim made the quill team. We, we talked like, uh, I think two weeks ago or something. And, and, and he mentioned this kind of, that, that there were some open implementation questions around mempool handling. And so we kind of decided to look into that a little bit. And so I basically wrote up some of my thoughts around specifically the sorting, because I think most of the mempool related um, questions, um, like how to handle what 1559 transactions differently from, from legacy transactions really boil down to, 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 to um, sorting. And so, so my like basically, um, 
initial conclusions and again those those could be off i'm, I'm, I'm not i would definitely not not yet an expert or anything but, but but it appears to me that there's really basically two different types of sorting that usually happens in mempool the first one is just for miners that's like basically on the on the high end of transactions choose having an efficient way of, of finding the currently like highest paying transactions and of course highest paying meaning like uh, those that that basically have the highest effective tip um um, and, and, and currently, of course, you just use the, the gas price for that. Um, and so currently, for example, in, 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 in get the way that's implemented is with like a max heap where you, you basically have like a partially sorted list by, by maximum gas price and you just uh, um, traverse that to find the highest paying transactions. Um, and that doesn't quite work for 1559 because um, unfortunately, like, uh, like of course, um, I had these little diagrams, but of course the observation I think is, is an old one that with 1559, the, the relative order of transaction can, can change from the base fee changes because, because of this, the, these two parameters. So sometimes, so basically like um, uh, for, for low base, base fees, usually transactions are in the static period where they, they, they basically pay their maximum tip that they, they are willing to pay. But then at some point they reach this, this kind of inflection point where, where the, the base, base fee becomes so high that, they, that it starts eating into the tip they are still willing to pay. And so, uh, uh, and so for different transactions, that point is at a different location. And so when um, it, it can be that, that, that the transaction that was uh, willing to pay, to, have, to pay pay a higher tip, that, that now goes down and now basically all of a sudden is, is willing to pay less than another transaction. And so, so the relative order can, can switch and so you can't have like a static um, sorted uh, data structure anymore. Um, however, like I think specifically for, 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 the, for the question of, of, of mining, it, it, it seems to me that you can, you can kind of find a somewhat more clever but, but not all that much more com complex way of going about it. So, so the, the main observation that I had was basically that within this kind of what I'm call, calling ecstatic state where like you're, you, you're able to pay your full tip, right? And transactions that are all currently willing to uh, or able to pay their full tip, those, those continue to have a static order because while they are in this static range, of course, that, that's a static amount. So that's a, that's a, that the ordering stays constant. And then within the like the declining phase where your tip is, is being eaten into by the base fee basically transactions within that also uh, because because it's, it's like a linear one-to-one -one relationship like basically one more way in the base fee is one less way in your tip and so that also basically means that they all shift in the same speed and so so they never intersect so so transactions in that state also never kind of switch order and so it's really just about transactions where where they basically switch between those two 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 states and so I think what you can do is basically just have a somewhat a bit, but basically you can you can have like a one partially sort of heap for, for for the static transactions, one for the for the dynamic transactions. There are a few questions though that I haven't really that I don't I don't think I have quite clear answers yet. So basically what you would have to do every time a new block comes in that changes the space fee, you have to kind of pro process the ones that 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 now passed their like inflection point there and now switch between the two states. And it's not quite clear how you could if it effectively remove them from because because you, you don't actually want to to, to do a lot of, 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 of removal from these heaps. So there are a few intricacies, but I think generally directionally, this is like a really solvable problem. And then and the interestingly though, like the other sorting problem in mempool is on the other side, right? Not the high pay transactions, and that's only for a minor problem, but like for eviction, right? And and there you need you you want to find the the the, the, the basically bottom tier transactions to to, to get rid of. Um, and this is <laughs> It, 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 like it seems to me to be a little bit more complicated because um, in our legacy transactions, you again, just use the, the, the gas price, but what you're kind of optimizing for is you wanna get rid of the transactions that have the lowest chance of being included, right? Because those are the ones you, 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 you wanna drop. And previously with the like static order and everything, that is a very simple decision to make. You just look at the gas price. Now with 1559, again, with like the, 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 the dynamic order that can, that can shift over time, it's not clear anymore, right? Just because a transaction right now would be willing to, would have like a lower effective tip than, than another one, doesn't mean that it has like a lower chance of inclusion because maybe as soon as the best base fee goes a little bit higher then the transaction all of a sudden is, 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 is willing to pay more or something. So, so you kind of have to have the, like as implicit assumptions about the base fee behavior. So, so basically what you, the, the, the metric you would want to use is like the, like the, the uh, average uh, base, or like the the, the, the average base, the average effective tip um, uh, that, that that you expect, like the expected expected value of of of, of the of the of the um, effective tip that of the transaction over like all over like a probability distribution of, of, of future base fees, and of course you don't want to do it all, all that complicated. So the question is just. Um, 
can you find like a simple heuristic that 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 does something of that sort that is good enough? I mean, you don't for eviction, you don't really care if it's com like a intellectually completely perfect solution. It really just has to be practical enough, but it has to be practical enough under like a lot of different paradigms. So slowly changing base fee, like quickly quickly increasing one, quickly falling, highly um, volatile, uh, low volatility, all of these different paradigms. So basically. The goal just is find find a heuristic that is like really robust in all these paradigms, um, but then also you can implement with some efficient data structure where you don't like not you, you, what you don't want to do is basically every single time a new block comes in you don't want to go through your whole mempool recalculate this effect this uh, this is expected value for every single transaction and completely resort your mempool that that is too much I think at least uh, that is too much housekeeping effort uh, after every single block and so basically finding some heuristic that you can you can find some order that you only have to update slightly every single block or something uh, I don't know I, I have like I don't really have good good like concrete ideas around that yet I think it's it seems like that should also be kind of solvable though um, but it's it's a little bit more of a complex issue. So so that these are basically like my 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 thoughts on sorting. So there's maybe one more special case of like transaction replacement. But I think transaction replacement really is not all that complex because there you really only want it to be predictable by by the user because transaction replacement where you just replace a transaction or pending transaction because it's you you want to bump it basically. Uh, I think you can just have very simple rules that protect you against DOS um, um, issues, but also kind of keep this this the structure something. But but yeah, basically. So so I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm not sure if it was clear or something. And, and again, I, I might have been missing things or just previous write-ups or whatever on that topic. But that's my rough outline. So like high end for miners, low end for for, for eviction for all nodes, and high end you want an explicit solution, low end just some heuristic that's good enough. That's kind of where I'm at right now. I, I like that analysis. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I just I do have one question, which Maybe I also not being in every meeting missed something, but um, when you're talking about rem evicting transactions, isn't there a velocity? Like, isn't there a maximum rate of change of the base fee such that you could say like it would be a week before this transaction could be included or a day or there's some uh, longer bound where you know that the velocity of uh, base fee changes would certainly exclude uh, a transaction from a reasonable amount of time? Yes, uh, there, there is. I personally advocate for using a strategy like that. The caveat you have to, we have to remember though is that in a time of rapidly increasing base fee, it is possible to see the transaction pool filled entirely with transactions that meet that criteria. So even if you say that evict any transaction that cannot be included in the next block, it is still possible to have a transaction pool that is entirely filled with transactions that meet that criteria, and you still need to evict. So you still need a secondary eviction strategy in that case um, to deal with that situation at the least. Yeah, so, so, so I would, would, would agree that basically like a simple yes, no rule always runs into these edge cases where you can construct a situation where, where it's basically very close, but, but you're still just be below whatever base fee they, they need or something. And um, so some, some, just some, some, some relative metric where, where you have like one value per transaction they can assign and, and then you just compare and, and, and they and, and evict those with, with, with the lowest value. Um, I, think, I think that is uh, preferable, but I do think that it, it, it illustrates how while there is like again there's some uncertainty where tr transaction order can flip there's still a lot of structure in, in that like it can only flip to a limited extent because the base fee can only change at a certain rate and all of these things so i think you still have you, you can still come up with with sorting that is mostly stable that they kind of oh, when but once the base fee starts to change it, it only changes a little bit and so you you can you basically only have to to do a little bit of, of kind of updating of, of, of your sorting there um but yeah but yeah the goal really should just be to, to be able to, to, to identify the, the worst transactions, no matter like how close they are to being includable or how, how far away or all, all of that. So another thing that uh, Light Client brought up last week or week before is that if we can get, if we change the, the minor bribe or tip or whatever we're calling it, calling it this week to be static, not dynamic. I'm willing to pay this much base fee 
up to this much base fee, and I'm willing to pay this much to the miner. And those two are separate values. And so the total you pay is the sum of the base fee plus the miner. Um, that greatly simplifies the transaction sorting problem, but it introduces a new problem that it greatly increases the complexity of upgrading legacy transactions to this new transaction type. So if when people are thinking about this problem, if you can solve that problem, the upgrade, how do we upgrade legacy transactions when the, the tip or the minor bribe or a gas premium, whatever you call it, is static, then this whole problem of transaction sorting goes away and we're back to basically legacy style, very simple sort. I do have to say though, um, because because Lifetime and I, we, we, we talked about that um, um, uh, quite a bit after, after that and the impression that I got, and, and of course, um, feel, feel free to correct me there, but the impression that I got there is that that is not indeed actually correct because it turns out you still, you, you because like for with these decisions you still want to do this kind of the, like the the chance of inclusion or something and just because now it's a cliff so basically you have a hard drop off that still kind of gives you the property that there's like a non-static order but basically because because there can be a transaction that is um like more more, more easy that's it's basically higher paying for a long time and then it just instead of gradually dropping off it just immediately drops drops off to like a uh, inclusion chance of zero basically but but it still has this this property that you can have inter in intersections between the the kind of the, the relative value of, of, of two transactions and so it's not in fact that it now all of a sudden basically it's a static order again uh, you still have the property that that basically order orders dynamic and flips and so you kind of have to do this expected value thing so I personally don't actually think that this is that that, that this is that that basically gets rid of the of the problem. So, Micah, you were saying that uh, the problem is the promotion. Uh, yeah, that's of the fair. I, I do think it, but you are correct. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear yes. me? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Okay. Right. Um, Micah, you were saying that the problem of promoting the legacy transaction types under that suggestion that you had is because there's now just the static fee that does it. There's no basically item that depends on a per gas basis, right? Yeah, it just doesn't fit with the model we have for upgrades. So for upgrades, the, the model we have right now, of course, is we just say the legacy transaction gas price is both the base fee and the uh, minor bribe. Both values are the same thing, and everything kind of just works out magically. If the these two values were, if sorry, the fee cap and the minor bribe, if the minor bribe and fee cap are now separate, and so they're additive onto each other, so the the thing you pay is now base fee plus minor bribe. We can no longer just set the fee cap and the minor bribe to the legacy transactions uh, gas price. Uh, that doesn't work. I've forgotten, but it. Hmm. Um, I would also argue that it the one other major drawback that that solution has um, is basically that you have this. Um, just the like the, the, the behavior again of like basically your transaction is willing to pay a certain tip and then as soon as what under like the dynamic approach uh, basically usually you would have this this inflection point and then you, the tip you're willing to pay slowly degrades but you can still be included in the block whereas under the new proposal basically you could at that point you could just not long, no longer be included and so from you like from a UX um, point of view I think it is also a little bit problematic that now you could have transactions that are like, like price-wise, perfectly able to get included, but they can't because of this this rule. So, so sorry. So I, I'm I'm personally a little bit skeptical of, of, of this approach. Sorry, I had something in my throat. So. <clears> throat> so I guess just but to I, make sure. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, so, no, I did only want to say, it, but it is like a very interesting, like an alternative approach to think about because I think I think if I remember correctly, that was actually the one that kind of when when like Lyn and I were talking about it, it's it's um, that was the one that that kind of led us to realize that um, basically within these different stages, uh, you still have the the, the the static order. So so it's a, definitely like a very interesting kind of um, thought experiment, but it I, I don't personally like it as an actual design.
And so just so I understand, it seems like the next step here on the eviction side is finding, is there a good enough heuristic that we can use, which might have some failure modes, but uh, that should, should work most of the time. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that, that's how I would at least see it. Got it. I think the most important thing is that we do not have a failure mode that results in a DOS vector against yes. clients for the eviction strategy. Pretty much anything else is, almost anything else is optional. Um, that being said, there are, like, if you are, the worst case eviction strategy is you're evicting from the, the most likely transactions to be included, right? It's like the pathological failure mode. Um, if you imagine that, then that can become a DOS vector because now clients are constantly dropping transactions that then they'd have to get fetch again as soon as they get included into the next block. And so we do have to be careful about that, but yep. that's really the, the core is don't allow DOS attacks. Um, Does any of this get easier to solve? I remember hearing, forgive me, because this is my first 1559 call, but I remember hearing rumblings about um, potentially enforcing at the protocol level that blocks are filled first at the EIP 1559 transactions. Does that solve any of this? Because you only have to relatively order them, like only order 1559 transactions among themselves and then legacy among themselves? So as, as I don't believe I it can, does. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. The, the problem is that even within 1559 transactions, if if you don't don't like uh, have any of these of these legacy converter transactions in there, I think within that block you still have similar issues. At least maybe it's easier when like most of the tip is some somewhat in like a similar range or something. But I, I think so. Like of course for the legacy side of things, it would make things easier because then you have the same properties again. But I don't I, I, I don't see at least why that would um solve the the issue on the one of nine side um maybe it will make it a little bit easier I, i'm not sure so what if you add also the static minor fee instead of the per gas minor fee and now can you deterministically sort those the 1559 pool You're saying have uh, two transaction pools, one that is legacy transactions that are, that once they're included in a block, they look like 1559 transactions, but um, the second pool is actual 1559 transactions, but they have the static gas price, is that, or sorry, gas premium, is that correct? My understanding? Uh, no, I was suggesting, or well, maybe, but uh, so I was suggesting that we have the 1559 transactions with, you know, the fixed, uh, the fixed tip, and then you, we just have legacy transactions as they always were in a different transaction pool, except they can only be included in a block after 1559 transaction. Oh, they can only fill up uh, empty space, basically. Yeah, and so they're, and so they're like you can evict them. However, you want if there's, or you can evict all of them if there's only 1559 transactions. And then the 1559 transactions as they are now also would have this sorting problem, I think, because of the per gas. So I don't yeah. know that we can have, we can have them be elastic. Because I don't know if we can have them be that second pool be elastic uh, because we don't know if we should. Mm. Like as long as you send out a block that has fifteen fifty nine transactions first, we, that is that is valid. Don't know if we should yeah. Yeah. expand the block. So if the block is under full, like less than it's fifty. You're really breaking up, Mika. Yeah, I think you would Sorry. in effect just expand the block one block late, and I I think um, expanding the. Uh, I think having the 1559 take up all of the um, block and then have the uh, uh, original transaction type take up the remainder. And then if that was full, expand the block. Um, that I think is a really weird game where it makes sense to like do all sorts of weird stuffing and price manipulation because now you can control the size of the block in this kind of counterintuitive way. I don't know that that 
all of all of those games are worth the the algorithm uh, benefit that you're aiming for. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I just remember hearing this as a suggestion, but I never heard kind of the counter argument to why it wouldn't work, but that makes sense. Um, yeah, just because we're running low on time and we still have a couple other things to cover. Is there anything else uh, regarding this that people really wanted to bring up now? Okay, if not, uh, I think, yeah, the last big thing we had uh, is Abdel has made some progress on generating uh, test nets with a large state. Um, Abdel, do you want to take a few minutes to kind of share that? Yes, sure. So uh, we want to see how the network uh, would work with uh, high block elasticity, like uh, can the network handle uh, twice the block size uh, as now. And uh, to that, the first approach was to uh, kind of fork mainnet, but we don't really like this approach because it implies to uh, do some tricky things in the code of the Ethereum clients. And we don't want to uh, merge that code because we don't want to introduce new uh, attack vector. So we wanted to explore another approach, uh, which is to have uh, basically to not touch uh, at all uh, Ethereum clients and to have uh, another standalone service that interacts with uh, clients and to see uh, how quick quickly we could generate uh, a state comparable to mainnet. So uh, we implemented the proof of concept for this service. So I will show you. Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes, okay. So basically we have a standalone service that will interact with the Ethereum client using the RPC endpoint. And we have a few REST API. So basically API to handle tasks because it is uh, all long running processes. So we need a way to uh, on the client side to, to see if the task is completed and the duration of the time uh, of the task, etc. And then uh, basically, uh, we only require to have two deployed smart contracts. So one to uh, create accounts and one to fill the, the storage, basically. Uh, so the first version we were uh, to create account, we were only doing uh, uh, basic transfers. So without using a smart contract, but it uh, requires to handle a large uh, TPS. And uh, this is more efficient to, uh, to create a bunch of accounts uh, per transaction. So this is why we create uh, the account directly in the smart contract. And also you can monitor the number of accounts created. And also, yeah, we have the other contract that uh, is responsible to uh, fill the state storage. And yeah, basically, I will show you a quick demo. So first, I, I start one Ethereum client with a very low difficulty to quickly produce blocks. OK. And then I start my standalone uh, service that has the RPC endpoint of my Ethereum client. And we have a web application. so. Uh, yeah, basically it connects to the Ethereum client and it, re it retrieves some configuration parameter. So for the moment, I, I don't have anything deployed because I just deployed the, the network from scratch. So the first thing will be to deploy the two contracts required. Okay, the second one. And now if I go to the configuration, I can see the addresses of the deployed contract and uh, some parameters uh, directly queried from the smart contract. So I have not created anything for the moment. So I will start, let's say, by creating 10,000 accounts and 15,000 uh, entries in the smart contract. Okay, so tasks are pending. <clears throat> Let's wait a few seconds. Okay, the account creation is done. And the state storage is done as well. 
And if I create again my smart contract, I, I can see that 10,000 accounts have been created and uh, 15,000 entries have been created in the smart contract. And I also have the address, uh, the last created address. And to show you some results, so basically we tried several iterations. We started from 10K accounts and 10K entries in the smart contract. And uh, between each iteration, we multiplied by 10 and we have measured uh, the time needed to uh, build the state. And so the last iteration was 100, 100 million. So this is something comparable to mainnet. And it took basically four days to, to build this large state. So the, the two processes have been done sequentially. Uh, next step will be to try uh, that in parallel. Uh, and obviously, uh, we did some tests with the single node network. And uh, if the approach sounds reasonable for you guys, uh, one next step will be to set up uh, a new IP1559 testnet and to uh, kind of build a large state comparable to mainnet. And I think, so we'll have to deploy multiple clients uh, on each type, uh, Bezo, Nethermine, Get. And uh, I think we should try to run uh, this, um, service on uh, all clients directly rather than building the state and then sync with the other clients that will be more efficient to make sure we all deploy our clients to the infrastructure and then we start to generate the state and with hopefully within four days or so we could be able to have something comparable to mainnet and then we could start to uh, play with the the high block elasticity uh, because we did some uh, tests with the high block elasticity on the current testnet, but the, the state is very small, so we don't see the impact on the large state. And we started to measure the evolution of the block production time uh, versus the number of accounts. So it does have a, a significant impact, actually. So it will be interesting to see how it will work with a large block elasticity. And yeah, that's pretty much it. That's really impressive. I just have a quick question. Um, after you've generated that, spent the four days to compute that state, um, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, it doesn't seem to say the size. Uh, the size so, uh, of the DB? Yeah. Uh, it's something like, I will show you. <laughs> Two hundred and thirty-seven gigs. So, does it make sense to create a backup of that for the respective clients so you can run more tests, or do you just want to destroy it? My plan was to destroy it and regener regenerate something from scratch using the tool because the time needed is quite uh, reasonable. I guess less than a week is. I I don't know. And these didn't use fifteen fifty nine transactions, no. right? Yeah, exactly. So we should probably have one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Never I think mind. we just did it with yeah, yeah, legacy. But we should probably have. I agree with you, Rick. That like once we do it with fifteen fifty nine style transactions, yeah, we should keep that and not have everybody but need to run a four day process every time. It it does not really matter. I, I mean, to fill the network, we don't need to use fifteen fifty nine uh, transactions because most of the work is done in the smart contract anyway. So that won't affect the result. Yeah, okay. oh, I guess, yeah. What we want is we want the network, once we have the large state, we want whatever network to be able yeah. to, uh, to so it is. Fifth, yeah, okay. Oh, it so we could use that. It. Yeah, 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 we could do, yeah. Put that in like a set of clients that support 1559 and then run the transaction generator yeah. tool, right? Yeah. Okay, so I guess in that case, we probably should not delete it now. We probably should okay. take it around. Okay, okay. So yeah, first I wanted to see if the approach makes sense for you and then we can see the next steps. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is to check if the, if the clients can handle the, the load at the level of the mainnet, right? Yeah. 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 So with the uh, two, twi two uh, yeah, with twice the block size, uh, of the mainnet, yeah. 
So you uh, so you generated like 100 million accounts because mainnet is 100 million yeah. accounts yeah. and then accounts. Yeah. And then there's also a smart contract which has 100 million storage slots. Yeah, with uh, 20 bytes per slot. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time. I know, Rai, you had, uh, you wanted to bring up 2718. Uh, do you think you can do that in like one minute or two? Yeah, I think if someone has arguments against it, then we won't and it'll go somewhere okay. else. But I'm hoping that it will just push through quickly. So essentially, since the writing's on the wall, 2718 is going to be in Berlin. And the whole point is to introduce tr transaction types. Is everyone good with... Um, having EIP 1559 transactions be a 2718 transaction. And we can just, you know, temporarily pick a value of like 15 for it and then pick a, um, what's it called? Like an incremental value once it's actually about to go into a hard fork. I guess my question to... would be, yeah, yeah, this. No good. How much time, like, does it slow down people right now to add 2718 support or, or not because we're already doing it as part of Berlin, right? Um, yeah, I was going to say that I think all the clients have it now. And so it would actually just simplify the encoding, decoding code paths to just have that be a type. Rami, can you say us if you have merged the master branch? Because I think the... I, I'm not sure they, they merged the master branch. Yeah, so actually we almost completed. Uh, so we just need a couple of more hours. So today we are going to create pull request on the uh, original KS repo. And would you be confident to use 2718 type transaction envelope for 1559 transaction? Have you looked at it or? Uh, uh, no, not yet. So we are rebasing on top of master. So that uh, transaction type uh, pull request is not merged yet, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe it makes sense. Yeah, to wait until it's part of the get code base, like it's actually merged into get. Uh, I don't know what the status is, um, and and then set a transaction type. And I, I assume we can kind of figure out async what we want the transaction number to be. Um, yeah. Because I guess I wouldn't want to slow down the stuff on like the large state test net if like it'll take a while to get it merged in Geth and and uh, um, and to then be yeah then we need to update the fifteen fifty nine implementation of Geth and whatnot. Uh, does that make sense? Sure, makes sense. One get once Geth goes in, then we can switch it to twenty seven eighteen. Yeah, and I guess we're we're kind of out of time, but. The final thing I wanted to see is like, when does it make sense to have a follow-up call? It feels like we have a lot of like parallel threads. Um, so should we have like, you know, breakout rooms for any of them? Does it make sense to just have maybe a call in two weeks instead of a month so that we can follow up async and, and kind of share updates in two weeks? Um, what do people feel will be like the most productive? I think, I think generally we should actually start planning the road to wrote to test nets and to release like so yep. we should actually transition to the stage when we plan how to how to move it to mainnet instead of just yep. um, analyzing it anymore it's like overwhelming proof lots of different research cases that show that it's very solid i mean probably like this, this few slightly risky points that were mentioned in uh yeah in the recent report, but apart from that, it would be great to start planning how to go to mainnet all the way. So have the roadmap, uh, what's the first target date that we have for the release and how we get there uh, when the clients join, what are the acceptance points, like ours from our perspective, from all the clients, when we say, okay, we are ready and that would be great. Yeah, I, th I agree with you. It seems to me like from a research side, it's pretty de-risk. The only two outstanding issues seem to be um, figuring out this transaction pool sorting, which is not, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. It just has to be done. And then maybe looking at the update rule, um, but that's also pretty minor. Um, I think with regards to Alcor devs, waiting until like Berlin is out or at least, you know, kind of finalized probably makes sense before bringing it up there. Um, so maybe, 
I, I can definitely work on putting together a roadmap over the next two weeks. Um, maybe it just makes sense, yeah, to, to follow up then to see how the work on the testnet is progressing. And if we have a solution for the, for the transaction pool stuff, um, and then how do we want to bring it to awkward devs basically after the holidays? Yeah, I generally think that we, we should totally decouple it from the Berlin conversation. It will be much, much better yeah. for us as a working group because uh, I, I still make this bet that there's like 10% chance that this will happen before Berlin. <laughs> oh, got and it. Okay. What, what, one, one last maybe a little aspect that I wanted to mention there is I think it might also make sense to start talking a little bit about like general timeline for, for, for like ethereum main it because I, I i think like starting maybe a year from now or something there'll be like a lot of these big changes with like the merge and maybe statelessness and so on and yeah. maybe get like a some feeling right because i would really hope that 159 might might be able to just go in maybe like summer slash autumn or something so so, so that yeah. then we can steer clear of all of those because otherwise it might be a delay of over a year additionally just because why all these yeah. higher priority that things I agree. That was always my goal is to get fifteen fifty nine ship before stateless because otherwise having the two kind of come in at the same time is 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 pretty bad. Um, yeah, but then now also with the accelerated merge timeline that might also yeah, be yeah. similar yeah. similar time. Yeah, agreed. So I guess yeah. Sorry, we're already a bit over time. Does are people fine having another call in two weeks and doing stuff async until then and using that call maybe to do a bit more of the planning? At least I can share a first draft of the planning of like what I think makes sense to bring to all core devs. And, uh, and we can also follow up on the various kind of uh, transaction pool and, and other issues. Okay, I'll take, I'll take uh, this as a yes. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. This, this was great. Uh, I'll try to upload it to YouTube later today. Thanks, bye. Thanks, team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone so, so much. Everyone, so much. Bye. Bye.